Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 12th and final round. Right hand, Golovkin steps in and down he goes again. Unbelievable. Mayweather makes a pay. What a rookie mistake. A sensational left hook by Delaware. It's facts. I'm the best. You know what I mean? I sometimes I don't want to believe in myself, but it's the truth. I'm the best. I'm going to show you how great I am. From Southern California, this is the Last Round Podcast. Number 87 of the Last Round Podcast. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, thank you for listening once again, whether you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Radio Republic, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Boxing Social, YouTube, wherever you're at. We appreciate it once again. Um, if you're jumping on right now to uh, to listen to the Tommy Ward interview that was um that's obviously in the title is why some of you probably most likely clicked um that will be towards the latter half of this podcast so um if you don't want to hear mike and i talk you're more <laughs> than you're more than welcome to just fast forward us and get to that tommy ward interview uh, mike was able to record an interview with him just before uh we recorded uh this this part of the audio um but a disclaimer there was some audio issues right mike yeah there's some audio issues kind of the audio goes in and out a little bit, and then the, and then at the end, when I ask him about uh, you know training alongside Joseph Laws, we do lose him. Um, I think Tommy was outside using his cell phone for the interview, so it wasn't kind of the best connection. But you know, there's a good solid twenty minutes in there that you can listen to. Awesome, awesome. Well, as long as we still got some some uh, some good audio content there, um, you know, obviously we appreciate that. And then thank you to uh, Mr. Tommy Ward for jumping on with us, jumping on with Mike earlier today um but you know this is a a a rarity at least in in the last couple months it's just me and you even though we do have a guest this week again this part this part of the audio is just me and you mike what how come old school it's old school man it's like it's like well we're coming up on two years doing this show is it two years isn't it two years this month or next month so it was either the end of august or september just before the canelo fight Oh, that's right. So, like around uh, you know August September. So mm-hmm. we're coming up on two years. Uh, at the beginning of the of the when we started the show, it was just me and you for a while. You know, we had to build ourselves up. We had to you know build our reputation in order to attract guests. And I think we're doing all right so far. What do you think? Yeah, not too bad. Obviously, you know, it's just, boxers want to promote themselves. They're all uh, you know self commodities. So you know, it's kind of not the hardest to get some guests on. Obviously, some, you know, are kind of harder to get a hold of because of the amount of followers they have and the PR teams they sit behind. But, you know, boxing is very different compared to other sports. And in that in that essence, I'm sure this, you probably couldn't get a major uh, league baseball star or a soccer star, you know, to do a podcast because you couldn't get a hold of them. Well, of course, with that attitude, Mike, we can't get them. Of <laughs> course, you got to change You got to change that attitude. Um, but, you know, let's, uh, before we... Uh, you know, we, we get into the Tommy Ward interview uh, where we want to touch on some topics that are currently uh, happening in the world of boxing. Uh, one of them that we did want to touch on, we want to start with is, um, you know, Robert Garcia has that new YouTube show that he's been doing pretty much out of his gym. Right, right, Mike? Uh, I, I think, I don't know what it's called, the Robert, is it just the Robert Garcia show or what, what do they call it? Yeah, something along the lines of that, yeah. So something like that. They're, they they just started it within the last couple of weeks. Um, I don't know how often they release it, but they film it. You know, it, they got some editing behind it. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, Robert Garcia obviously has a lot of years in the game, so he has a lot of knowledge behind it. But what we wanted to touch on, um, you know, obviously one of his his fighters just captured his first world title in Joshua Franco, just defeated uh, Andrew Maloney, right? Um, in Vegas on one of the latest top rank cards, which by the way, top rank. We just talked about this right before we started recording. Top Rank is like way ahead of the curve in terms of all the other major promoters and putting out shows. You know, they're they're way ahead of the curve. And, you know, we talked about, I guess we'll touch on it a little later, but um, all the other promoters haven't put on anything. And they're like already almost to 10. So, you know, uh, but, you know, Robert Garcia, his fighter, Joshua Franco, just captured his first world title, major world title. I believe, was it, wasn't it the WBA, Mike? WBA, yeah. Right. Um and I think it was a, it, was it a, a split decision? It was a split decision. I think he got the knockdown in the twelfth round, which kind of sealed the victory for him. Right. So if he didn't get the knockdown mm-hmm. in that 
was it the 11th or 12th round? 11th or 12th, yeah. I can't oh, remember yeah. Exactly. It, was, it, was, it was one of the championship rounds. If he had, did not get the, that knockdown, I think, if I remember correctly, the fight would have been a draw. Mm-hmm. The fight would have been a draw. So, I mean, Franco got so lucky he was able or, you know, is it lucky or is it just, you know, talent, obviously. But, you know, I guess it's a little bit of both that he was able to find that opening to get that knockdown because that's what won him the fight, you know, from a mathematical standpoint. But um, what the issue is that um, just after that fight, I remember seeing on Twitter, um, on boxing Twitter, you know how boxing Twitter is, Mike. You know, we get we get the the trolls. We see the trolls. We know the trolls in the boxing hemisphere. But I remember um, reading people tweeting that Robert Garcia, as the as the judges were tallying up the scores, that a top rank official, and I don't know if this is correct or not, but some people on Twitter were saying that it was Carl Moretti, who's uh, I believe second in command um at top rank i believe or he's vice president of i think operations or something like that don't quote Mm -hmm. me on the exact title but he's obviously one of the high executives over there at top rank but robert garcia said that a top rank official and some people on online were saying it was car moretti was over there at the commission with the commissioner's table um pretty much talking to them while just before the, the scores were being announced um and robert garcia was yelling at him don't do it don't do it pretty much insinuating don't take the fight away from his fighter franco you know um and then robert garcia i think within the last couple of days on his uh youtube show that they he just created somebody had asked him about that and he talked about it he didn't name this person specifically but he said it was a top rank official he didn't want to throw them under the bus and he pretty much elaborated like completely about that happening I mean, what what was your take on the whole situation, Mike? It's called uh, Robert Gasse Unfiltered. <laughs> oh, is that what the show's called? Yeah, I just looked it up, yeah. Oh, okay, well, that's definitely unfiltered. I mean, what what did you think about that whole situation? I thought it was kind of, uh, you know, an odd situation to me. I, I feel that, you know, when the scars are getting tallied and handed in, that they really should be nobody around them. There shouldn't be anybody kind of putting pressure on anybody, anybody leaning over people's shoulders. You know, it should just be... The judges together, they just had, you know, come to the conclusion of who've won, you know, pass it to the referee. You know, it shouldn't be looked at. It shouldn't be anybody from top rank. It shouldn't be anybody from any other promotion, Matchroom, PBC, or anybody putting pressure on them, you know, to either go one way or the other. So, you know, I thought it was quite open of Robert to actually come out and say that. He didn't name names, but, you know, kind of open because... You know, a lot of people, you do get some odd scorecards. You know, there is the odd, you know, the boxing was kind of run by the mafia back in the day. So there are the old stories of, you know, corruption. I don't think it's probably as bad as it was, if if at all now. But, uh, you know, there's some underhand things you do here going on in the, the boxing right. community. I think, I think every boxing fan, uh, especially the hardcore fans, to an extent maybe the casual fan, but especially the hardcore fans who have been fans of the sport for years know that there's some type of corruption and you know maybe corruption might be a strong word who knows but there's some obviously there's there's types of shady dealings behind the scenes i think everybody knows that and there's over the years there's been fighters prominent fighters or prominent personalities in the sport who have came out and said something whether it's against the sanctioning bodies or against promoters you know, kind of breaking that fourth wall in terms of like behind the scenes, like, oh, this is, you know, I think everybody in terms of boxing fans know that something happens behind the scenes. Um, but at least to my knowledge, I don't think anybody of Robert Garcia's statue, stature, excuse me, at least within the last couple of years or so, any, anybody of his notable stature has pretty much brought that out and pretty much confirmed because he pretty much, he was talking about it. Like, like it wasn't surprising to him, Mm -hmm. you know, especially when, when he pretty much yelled out right before they announced the scores, don't do it. Don't do it. You know, don't do it to us. Don't do it to us. It's like, he knew like, ah, here we go again. Now I'm going to, I'm going to say something like, it's like, he knows obviously being in the game for so long. It's like, you know, with the, with the years of experience that he has, how many times do you think he's, been like he's seen this in front of him or he's heard about this what do you think 
Yeah, you, you do hear about it. I remember, I think it was Teddy Atlas talked about on a podcast one time. Um, I think it was with Joe Rogan when he was talking about um, that when you go to the event, you know, say if it's a Golden Boy event or a top rank event that, you know, Oscar De La Hoya or Bob Abram will, they'll take out all the referees, all the judges for kind of like a slap up meal, you know, spend a lot of money, wine and dine them, you know, kind of drill it into them like, hey, you know, like you're here kind of on behalf of Golden Boy and, you know, we kind of want some of that home cooking. You know, Teddy right. Atlas has touched on that before. And I, I won't name names, but I remember being in a gym one time where coaches said that they'd, they'd have like little, you know, little things said to them, kind of, you know, a judge or, a, you know, like a referee would walk past and they'd be chatting to the coach. Like, hey, you know, like my kid could do with a PlayStation for Christmas. You know, <laughs> you know, not literally asking them to buy it for them, but, you know, in so many words, kind of, you know, dropping hints that like, hey, you know, if you buy that, then, you know, your gym might do quite well this year. So, no, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's like in, insinuating certain things without really kind of throwing it out there, at least in the public eye. I mean, I don't know. I, I just thought it was interesting. I like it, you know, kind of going back to the notion that every hardcore boxing fan, you know, kind of knows their stuff behind the scenes, especially with there being individual separate sanctioning bodies, major world title bodies in the sport wba wbo wbc ibf um you know it it's like it's like it's like beating the like the drum all over again you know repetitively like each one of them essentially um technically has an association with one promoter or the other you know wbo is essentially associated with top rank a lot um wba is associated with um pbc right and matchroom and Matchroom. Um, WBO is also associated with Frank Ro- Frank Warren a lot. Um, WBC is, what would you, Me- pe- Mexican fighters? <laughs> Me- Mexican fighters, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, like, it, it, it's not, you know, we're, we're, we're not, we're not out here to like, we're not saying stuff like this to like, slander or anything. It's, it's just like, that's what you see. It's not hidden. It's not hidden. No. It's not. It's not like it, it. It's like what we see, and like we. I think we've been in the game long enough, especially going to as many events as we've had over the years, where we've seen it. You know, like it happens. It happens. You know, like people can deny it as much as they want that it doesn't happen, but it happens. You know, like that's why. You know, is is Dana White? Is Dana White right? that he if he does enter into boxing and wants to start like his own promotion and platform is he right not to use any of the sanctioning bodies and he just wants to create his own titles like he has for the ufc like is he right in that regard i don't know you know i i think i look forward to when he does jump in if he does jump in obviously he keeps delaying it delaying it and you know it's probably gonna be a while i probably won't we probably won't hear anything about it until sometime next year but that's just an interesting concept to see what happens, you know, because, you know, it, it, it kind of go, goes back to the whole money issue. Remember when Cotto, you remember when Cotto was supposed to fight when he fought Canelo mm. and um, he was supposed to put his WBC title on the line or, or something like that. And reportedly uh, the WBC wanted like $300,000 or something like, like the yeah. fee. Do you remember that? Yeah, it's like 9%, right? Of the, of the purse, I think. Something like that, something like that. And Cotto, Cotto told him he wasn't going to pay that. And I don't know, I guess the negotiations didn't work. I don't know what happened. But Cotto just pretty much said, like, nope, I'm not going to do it. Like, I don't think there was a belt on the line in that fight. I think they just fought, right? I believe so, yeah. I think he actually dropped the WPC because of that. So, I mean, like, like I said, it, it, it happens. And Robert Garcia kind of putting it out there, um, especially recently, uh, is, is, is a big deal whether people believe it or not, it's, it is a big deal. Um, and, but you know, how, how are you going to combat that? You know, what, what, at least from your opinion, Mike, you know, watching the sport for as, as long as you've had, and then, you know, obviously being a part of the, the media as you have, like, is there any potential solutions to something like that? Like, how would you fix or at least try to elevate something like that? You should really have them, you know, either away from, you know, the promotional team, so people can't just walk over to them. I know the WBC recently has started doing the electronic scoring from uh, away from ringside, where they had, I think, a seven 
electronic scorers who used to just watch it like either from home or from the back. Um, electronic scoring where it's not handwritten and it can can be changed, you know, anything like that. So something where p- pressure can't be put onto referees and judges to, you know, change a score or anything like that. But then again, obviously beforehand, you've got the A side and B side and, you know, the judges and the referees know going into a fight, hey, this is the, this is the, this is the A side, this is the home fighter, this is the guy that's going to pay the bills and, hey, if you come up with the wrong score that we won't like, you won't be getting picked. Right, right. I mean, you would think, you would think that like, at least with commission or something, like you would think that like, because a government entity, a government agency is essentially involved in regulating your sport and regulating your event, pretty much sanctioning your event. I, if something comes up like where they're kind of trying to go bribe or they're trying to go like influence or whatever, like a government official, like, I mean, what did you think? Isn't there consequences for something like that? Like, is there anything on the, on the books, at least here in California in terms of, from any legal standpoint, you would have thought so. You know, the, the, like you said, they're working. They're a state official, so you would have thought there'd be something, some kind of corruption in sports, corruptment. Because at the end of the day, it, it, there's a, it's it's for money, right? You know, so you're affecting someone's paycheck because you're affecting the winner and the loser. So right. I would imagine there'd be something along the lines, but I don't know why they don't have younger officials. They always seem to be the same batch. Like how many years have we seen Adelaide Bird? You know, how many <laughs> years have we seen you know Robert Bird? Right, you know, Jack Reese is still good at you know he's at his age still, but you know how many years have we seen the same faces over and over again? Why right. do they not have like 30, 40 year old people whose you know eyesight is slightly better and they may know the game a little bit better? So right. They, why don't they have like a feeder system that like they have in you know soccer refereeing, like, which I used to do in the UK? There's there's an element of where you're coming up. This progress, you know, you start at like a, a low level and you work your way up, and eventually you reach the top if you're good enough. You know, why don't why don't they have that? Right. No, I agree. I agree. I mean, you know, I I, I guess it's just kind of like like you mentioned Jack Reese, Jack Reese, and all those guys, and then in Vegas you got Kenny Bayless and all those guys. You know, those are your top guys, the the veteran guys who you know you trust to do the big fights. They can handle themselves in the big fights. So you go to your star players. I mean, it's just like sports. You know, like you go to your star player to to kind of pull pull it through to to to, to win you the game in a, in a sense to use that analogy. I mean that that's what happens. You know, that's what happens. But you're right though. I think in, in, in you know as they retire, who was that? Was it Pat Russell? Pat Russell. Remember he was the one who did the yeah. the Vargas Bradley fight in StubHub out here, out here in uh, in Carson. Um, and remember he he stopped the fight because he thought it was the clapper was the bell. And then Vargas thought he won. He thought he stopped the fight in his favor, but he had like ten seconds left. And then at the end, he said, "I, I thought the I thought the clapper was the bell." Mm. You know, like and at that point, Bradley, who knows, Vargas maybe could have could have stopped him in those ten seconds because Bradley was, you know, his equilibrium was off the charts. But I mean, who knows? And I think Pat Russell, that referee over here in the in California, I think he retired after that, or I think he wasn't a referee after that. I think that was his last fight. No, I think you're right, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I guess kind of going back to, to the original topic, like, you know, Robert Garcia kind of pretty much shedding a light. And, like, somebody of his sta- – I, th- I think that's a big deal. Somebody of his stature in the boxing game, like a reputable trainer who's trained world champions, continues to train world champions, to c- continues to train guys to get to their first world tra- championship like Joshua Franco. And him pretty much throwing it out there – and addressing it and confirming it, at least that instance, um, I think that that's huge. That's a big deal. And I made up, but I think like it's just it's a topic right now. But eventually, it's just gonna kind of fall fall by the wayside because it's 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 it is prevalent, and people are just like, well, what are we supposed to do about it? You know, there's nothing really you can do to regulate something like that. I think the problem is, is he he said it, but at the end of the day, the score was right. Right. You know, like he did raise he did raise it, but it didn't happen. I think that's one thing we need to kind of get across as well is and Joshua Franco, in my opinion, was the underdog and he still did get the right result on the night. I mean, I I thought it was a shock result. I thought Maloney was going to be the favorite coming in. Franco was a stand in late replacement, maybe had a week 
Was it maybe something like that? Well, I remember I remember we were texting about that when Franco got announced as uh as a substitution mm. to fight Maloney. And um I had told you I was just like, I'm telling you, man, Franco's gonna gonna give him a fight. And you and uh and you thought like, no, well Maloney's you know, Maloney's a champion and, and that wasn't it wasn't that I I was doubting Maloney. I just thought that like because Franco has been training with Robert Garcia for so long, he's been a part of that camp. And they get, they have world champions in there. They they spar guys bigger than themselves all the time, and he get they get. I mean, I don't think it's no secret that you get really good work at the Garcia boxing gym over here in Riverside, California. Um, regardless if he was a late substitution or not, he was obviously still training consistently and keep staying in shape. So um, that's why I told you I was just like, don't be surprised, man. Like Franco, he could pull it off, and he pulled it off. And but I mean, there's going to be a rematch now, so. Yeah. You know, I, if Maloney wins, is it, is it a trilogy or is top rank going to try to, to, stay, <laughs> another, to stay away from that? another Frank Joshua Franco trilogy? Because he had a trilogy yeah, with, with Negrete. Yeah, it's true. I mean, hey, if he's producing those types of fights, I mean, he's he's obviously fun to watch, you know. I just thought going into the fight, his body work, you know, two draws and a win against uh, Negrete. And then he also had that. He had that loss over in uh, oh, where was it? It was when they fought Golden Boy did a card in uh, was it Puerto Rico or somewhere? Was it? That's a while ago. And he got he got stopped on his feet. It was kind of like an early stoppage. He was kind of like out on his feet, and the referee kind of jumped in. I, but everyone kind of said it was a little bit early. He should have maybe right. have taken a few more shots. But um, you know, if, I just, like I was wrong. It's at the end of the day, you were right. You know, Styles make fights. He managed to hurt Maloney early on, perforate his eardrum, and jumped on it. Took the took the chances and. You know, he's a local fighter, so I always want the local guys to do well. He's, you know, obviously based in San Antonio, but fights out of Riverside with uh, Robert Garcia. So, I I just think that like those three fights that he had with with Oscar Negrete, um, because uh, like you said, Oscar Negrete was the original opponent, mm-hmm. but then I I think he had an injury. I'm not sure what happened, but he wasn't he wasn't able to uh to take the fight. But I think even Oscar Negrete, whether it was him or Franco. Being in the ring with Maloney, I think would have gave him a fight, either or. Especially Negrete, because he's just very Mexican style, hasn't he? You know, he, yeah. even, though, even though he's Colombian, he has that come forward I, style. I think I think the three fights that they each had with each other, Negrete and Franco, really polished them as much as they can. Like it really took them into deep waters and made them fight, and really made both of them. They made them each better, a better fighter. So that's why. If 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 Franco didn't have that trilogy with Negrete before this fight and he would have got this fight, I probably would have went with Maloney and agreed with him. But like, yeah, you know what? I still would have gave Franco the benefit of the doubt. Like, you know what? He's 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 a wild card. Like he's he's a, he's a Garcia trained fighter. But because of that trilogy with Negrete, I was just like, you know what? I think he's gonna take it, man. He's those three those three wars he had with Negrete, like that that really sharpened him up. And you know, it, it worked out, but it's not like Maloney like got run over. Like he he did put up a fight. It was a good fight, but you know, and I, I'm I'm just glad there's going to be a rematch because it you know, it, obviously they're both going to be hungry now. To I think the rematch is going to be even better than the first one. I think so. It'd be good to see. You know, obviously Maloney ended up with a lot of injuries, so he'll probably have a little bit of a lie, a little bit of a layoff before he comes back. And you know, look at Joshua Franco, twenty twenty four years old, and he's a world champion. So. That's you know, crazy, con- con- man. Congrats to him. Yeah. Hey, man, Golden, Golden Boy, the last several months or so, like, has they went from having, like, pretty much not Canelo as the only world champion in their stable to now having Joseph Diaz, Joshua Franco, Canelo, uh, T- Tixera, Patrick Teixeira, his brother. Uh, who's his they, brother again? They, they signed his brother, didn't they? Didn't, isn't there two of them and they're both, they're both champs? Are they both champs? Are his brothers a champ too? Oh, yeah, wow. I think so. Um, and uh, I mean, do you want to count? Um, Jaime Munguia? Do you want to count Jaime Munguia? Technically, mm, Ronnie, Ronnie, take? Ronnie Rios the, with the gold. Ronnie Rios with the gold. Yeah, I mean that I, that counts. I mean that that's you know even though it's another random title, but I think that counts for something. Um, you know, they kind of really rebounded in in the in the world championship aspect and you know 
that just comes to show you then in a couple months span it just can kind of switch but you know whatever i just thought that was an interesting topic that we should touch on and then obviously we were uh we're gonna touch on uh your favorite or mine the big baby jerome miller popping again and i just got one question mike just one question for you and our listeners are you surprised no no Whoa. Not Why surprised not? at all. You know, obviously he popped during his kickboxing years. He popped with, you know, Anthony Joshua. I was I was just surprised that, like, he was stupid enough to do it because, you know, once you've been caught, you know that when you come back, you're going to be under the limelight, you know, a lot more than you were before. And, um, you know, he came back with top rank and he had, I think it was six-figure paydays lined up. But they probably would have maneuvered him into a uh, – you know, a title shot later down the line. And he threw that away again because he couldn't stay away. And, you know, I was I was kind of intrigued today to watch, uh, you know, Robert, Rob Tebbett, our boy from the Boxing Social, did a great interview with Mauricio Suleiman. And he was talking about that subject. And Mauricio Suleiman stated that he, he tried to get Big Baby to sign up to the WBC clean boxing program. He refused. Wow. He wouldn't do it. Wow. Wow. That's crazy, man. That's fat. Muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry, we had some technical difficulties right there. And I think we are back now. Oh, wait a minute. Hold up. It's a stupid mic. Okay, now we're back. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Technical difficulties, ladies and gentlemen. This is what we uh, have to deal with as we're uh, trying to adapt to the quarantine COVID podcasting world. But if anybody wants to listen to that interview, it's on Boxing Social's YouTube page. It came out today. Um, they go over, you know, the franchise titles, and you know, Rob Tebbett kind of puts uh, Mauricio Suleiman on the back foot with some tricky questions. So, do you, he, do you, do you, think, do you think that Jer- that's good though? That's good that he puts him, yeah, kind of gives him those hard hitting questions. But yeah, I also got to give it to Mauricio Suleiman because, like, for for even going on, because I mean, like, if you, it's not hard to like look at. Boxing Social's interviewers, their team, uh, especially Rob Tebbett, who he, he did this interview, right? Yeah, he did it, yeah. It's not hard to go and see their past body of work and see that they don't throw you softball questions. They throw you some pretty good questions that's going to make you think. So, you know, uh, you know, credit to the president of WBC, Mauricio Suleiman, for uh, at least jumping on there with them because I'm, I'm sure he knew that he wasn't going to get softball questions. So he did it, man. He did it. So, but like you said, people want to check that out. Go on Boxing Social's YouTube page. Um, but do you think that Miller? Do you think he tw- he was cycling off, or he was try- because of this pandemic? He thought, oh, I can get on it right now, and by the time I have to take the test, it won't pop up because and you know because he thought, oh, this pandemic, nothing's going to happen for months. Do you think he took it like okay? Let's just say lockdown started and it, it did in, in pretty much the whole world technically in march of this year do you think in march he was just like oh boom yeah without a doubt i'm sure he had a kind of like a time frame with top rank that he thought you know june july august that the, he would be back in the ring and i'm sure he you know started using and probably thought that either you know his tests weren't going to be till later in the year or maybe the people that kind of write his cycle for him, you know, thought that he would be, you know, it would have been out of his system. And maybe he got a surprise test he didn't expect. Maybe they just timed it completely wrong. Um, something along those those lines. But, you know, when, when he's such a big guy, it kind of all makes sense. We always used to wonder, you know, like someone 300, and 300 plus pounds, you know, how is he throwing either the most or he was the top three for punches thrown? You know, it was that weight. It was just, you know, we obviously just at the time were thinking he was some kind of genetic freak, but, you know. The, the genetic freak. That should have been his, his nickname instead of Big Baby. But, well, what, remember Wilder called it. Wilder called it years ago. He did an interview in a, when he was driving somewhere and somebody was filming him like on an Instagram live or something like that. And he called it. He said, he's like, I know that he's cheating. And he was right. That's crazy, That's crazy man. That's crazy. Like, I wonder, 
I wonder what, I wonder what, because I was reading the top rank before they actually signed him. Obviously, they got a lot of criticism for it, but I read that a lot of people in top rank, like they were kind of divided on signing him. Some of them didn't want to give him the chance because of his past history, and the other the other half wanted to give them the chance. But when they signed him, it's, you know, it was conveniently because they had just signed Tyson Fury and they had Pulev. So they were trying to stack, like stack their heavyweight division to compete with the, the other promote the other promoters like Matchroom and stuff, Anthony Joshua, Deontay Wilder, or PBC. Obviously, it was smart for top rank to try to pick up these heavyweights. They struck a deal with Tyson Fury, Pulev, and Miller's out there. So they're just like, well, we need some type of name, even though he's a cheater. We still need something, you know. But I was reading that reportedly that a lot of people in top rank were divided on signing him. Imagine, imagine that when that news broke that he popped again. Imagine what that those those employees within top rank who were against it from the beginning. Imagine, you know, the, them texting or calling the people who were for like, what did I tell you? What a waste of time, you know, like. I can just imagine that. Yeah, it's you know the business decision for the people that wanted him there. It's uh, it's one of those ones where you know, like the Floyd Mayweather thing, where people are either for him and they want to watch him, or they want to see him get beat. So you know, I'm sure there was plenty of people that you know had Jerome Miller just kind of like painted as a villain, and they were kind of you know they would pay to see him hopefully lose to one of the big guys, your Wilders or Joshua's Tyson Fury later down the line. But like you said, you know they were stacking their cards and. You know, essentially, he he was still a name, so yeah. he would he would have been you know a good opponent for um, for Tyson Fury down the line because you know at the time he was unbeaten, larger than life character. He's good on the mic, so he kind of is you know promotionally uh, someone very good to sign because I've met him. I met him quite a few times, and that's why I kind of had the feeling he was going to sign for top rank because when I went to the Tyson Fury fights in Vegas, he was there. He was there, that's right. Yeah. And when I was at the Cosmopolitan for the Valdez fight and um, Carl Frampton, the Valdez and uh, Adam Lopez, he, he right. was there, he was there then. So you kind of you could see he was going to sign for top rank because he was at all their events. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. But you know, I guess that kind of you kind of have to take risks. And anywhere in life, especially in boxing, you know, and I think, you know, top rank obviously knew that signing him, they were going to get criticism, but you know, it backfired on them, you know, will he, but, will he, fight, will he fight again? <sighs> will he, will he box again? Let's let, I'll narrow it down to boxing. Cause you know, he could, he could end up in kickboxing and I, I think, I think he'll end up in, he'll be in the WWE as a villain. What? What? <laughs> no, he doesn't have. I don't think he has the name or the the clout to be in WWE. I doubt he's it. Three hundred pounds zone. He's good on the mic. Mm. I, I WWE would get that's too much bad PR for them, and I don't know. It's a crazy thing have happened. No such but, thing as bad PR. Remember that old saying. Let me let me give you an analogy here. You're saying will he box again? Will somebody give him a chance again? That's the same question that people ask about Chavez Jr. What's the difference? Do you mean Chavez Jr. for tech, for popping, or do you mean just Chavez Jr. No, just for? I'm, I'm just saying in general. Obviously, Chavez Jr.'s never popped, at least from you know that we know of or anything. And it's just it's just more like okay, compare the compare both situations. Chavez Jr. because of his reputation, his behavior, uh, you know, especially with the fight he had with Danny Jacobs last December. Um, and then you got Jarrell Big Baby Miller. I'm, I'm just talking about in, in terms of like a, a general public opinion, a sentiment, how people say like, oh, they shouldn't give him another chance, so you give him another chance. It's both the, it's, in that regard, it's, just, it's the same whether people want to believe it or not. Like they shouldn't give these people another chance. But what's the difference in your opinion? Chavez Jr. has the, the name. He has that you know legion of fans because of his father and – you know, he hasn't popped, you know, it's just his lifestyle and his way and his addiction to, you know, marijuana and prescription medication and stuff like that, that, you know, Chavez Jr. is essentially killing Chavez Jr. Whereas Jarrell Miller just needs that crutch, even though he's a larger than life guy at 300 pounds, he obviously needs steroids to, you know, step into the ring and, you know, without them, maybe he just feels smaller and, you know, they, they say they're, they're addictive, you know, when you don't have all that extra testosterone in your body, then you don't feel the same. So, I think 
it's, I think it's kind of two different scenarios, really. I would say you're better off kind of comparing uh, Miller to someone like Pavetkin. You know, right. he's he's still fighting. He's still getting huge paydays, and he's fighting a huge fight and probably getting a very good payday on the matchroom card with um, the Dillian White in right. the, in the what August, right you know, ne- next month. So it's kind of you're probably better comparing those two, but because obviously he popped in that big fight when he was supposed to fight Wilder, right. And Wilder was going to Russia for that fight, too. Mm. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. I don't know. I don't know. But I like. I think that that's a good point that Pavetkin has popped. I think Pavetkin popped multiple times, too, right? Like, yeah. And he's still consistently getting pretty decent paydays and pretty big fights. He's getting one against Dillian White soon. Uh, in the, I think it's going to be the finale of the, the, back, the Batchroom Backyard fights or something like that, right? Is that the AJ payday as well? Yeah, so you're right. I think that's a great point that uh, Pavekin um, is getting those those opportunities. But I think the biggest difference with Pavekin, at least, is that Pavekin is foreign, exactly. and most of his fights are overseas. Yeah, it's not and, he's not, he's not got the English or American media, right? You know, he doesn't get that type of scrutiny. That it, well, whereas Jarrell Miller is from Brooklyn, New York, I believe. He's, he's a New Yorker. He's an American. So the media, especially the boxing media, well, essentially, pretty much primarily the boxing media, they put a lot of attention on him over here, especially when he was, gonna, he was supposed to fight AJ in AJ's debut in the United States as Madison Square Garden. That put a lot of eyeballs on him. So you're right. Uh, I think Miller, I think for the next three, four years, nobody's going to touch him in America. Uh, at least in that, in terms of the major promoters, I don't think so. But you know, never like you said, crazier things have happened. People still do business with other people, and if they can get Miller to sign up to fight one of their guys, because Miller's kind of a, technically a name in a sense, and are able to underpay him and kind of profit that rest of the money that he would have commanded initially. Will that happen? I would like to see whether they come out with that John Jones excuse where, you know, he tested positive because it's, it's, it's pulsing, you know, like it's still in his, in his body because it's still, you know, technically in your, in your fats. And when you're training, it comes out. Right. And because, you know, that's what they've been using for John Jones over the last couple of fights when they had to move the fight from Las Vegas to, to LA when he fought uh, Gustafsson for the second time. So right. it, I'd be interested to see when to do the B sample and they actually make some kind of uh, announcement what it is they come out with or whether he just has tested for a high level of that GW 15, 16 right. supplement. And he was just, you know, popping again. He was just, you know, risking it. So, Right. No, you're right. You're right. Uh, and before we uh, kind of throw it to the Tommy Ward interview that you did earlier, just before this, this recording, Mike, um, let, let's quickly touch on... Uh, Sergey Dervachenko um, has, you know, been reported to have offers to fight Charlo, the middleweight Charlo, um, and Canelo. Um, obviously, Dervachenko and Charlo are both advised by Al Heyman, so obviously that seems like it's more likely to happen. Um, it's reportedly been said that Canelo wants to fight Dervachenko or offered them, him a fight at 168, whereas Charlo would be at 160. What's your take on it, Mike? I think we're more likely to see the Derevchenko Charlo fight, and I think we'll see Canelo fight uh, uh, David Lemieux. I think Golden Boy have have been trying to put that fight together for so long. It's a fight that will probably be cheaper, you know, because of um, you know they're going to lose what ten fifteen million in gate money. So I'm sure Lemieux will probably take a smaller purse. You know um, what? I don't, I, don't, I don't think so, though. I don't I, I don't think so. I think Lemieux. Like, he's I just been, don't. He's been I struggling, though. No? no, you're right. You're right. But I, I just think that Canelo, like, the mentality he has as a fighter, I think obviously he has power. He would tell Golden Boy, like, no, I'm not going to fight Lemieux. Like, we tried to make that fight already before multiple times and it didn't work. You know, I feel like Canelo, like, the criticism would get to him really bad even even though this is a covid era and you know you can kind of give them reasoning for doing certain decisions i still think that the pride 
and himself as a prize fighter and as a top pound for pound fighter, I don't think he would do that. I don't. I, I think he would decline Lemieux. Uh, like Lemieux would have to be like an ultimate, ultimate last resort. It, that's my opinion, at least. I mean, I hope you're right. I mean, I, I would love to see him fight. It's not looking like Billy Joe Saunders, so we're, we're down to Callum Smith, Chris Eubank Jr. Um, there seems to be the only real names. John Ryder seems to be trying to put himself in the in the picture frame. I, know, but I saw that. What the hell is that? I don't. I don't know why we don't seem to have any stateside people that want to want to fight him at the minute. Um, I don't. I don't. I, I just don't see the the Derevchenko fight. I think you like you touched on. I think the PBC, PBC, Derevchenko, Chalo fight is one we'll probably see. And if we do, I think Derevchenko beats him. If Derevchenko comes in with you know, a performance like he did against Triple G where I thought he beat Triple G. Um, if he comes in, fights anything like that, then I think uh, Derevchenko wins on the night. He beats Charlo? Yeah. I, I think oh, so. yeah. I agree with that. I think Derevchenko beats Charlo. Charlo, is, I think, is a very... Uh, I think it's a good fight. I think it's a good fight for both of them, especially for Charlo, because Derevchenko is a top contending middleweight at the he's moment. A, he's a technician. Like he's, Yeah. He's a great like, fighter. Like, yeah. like, his, like his nickname, you know, he can, he can think on his feet. His punch selection is very, very good. He always comes in looking fit. Charlo, I think, is a little bit more one-dimensional. I think he's had a lot of fights his own way. They've picked, you know, certain styles to make Charlo look very good. Um, I think it's, it's a really good fight for Jerry Vachenko. And, yeah. and I think if he comes in and gives him 60 70% of a performance he did against Triple G, then I think he beats Charlo. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think Derevchenko, um, from my view, would be the favorite against Charlo. But I don't think Charlo... I think for Charlo, it would also be a, a great step-up fight, especially because he has a world title. And it's a great fight to really show. I think that would bring the best out of Charlo against a Derevchenko. Like, if he beats a Derevchenko, depending on how he beats him, uh, you know... I think he should get a lot of credit, you know, because I think that the, the Charlo brothers at the moment, you know, they get a lot of flack right now. Um, it's but, a strange, it's a strange fight for PBC to make. I don't. That's very well, odd. I mean, for I mean, them what, to, I mean why, why would it be strange when they're both PBC fighters? Obviously, Al Heyman would want, like, if he if he's going to send Dervinchenko over to fight Canelo, obviously, he'll, Al Heyman will get a piece of that that payday and. German Chico's obviously got talent to possibly beat Canelo. Like he's obviously a technician, but you know, why wouldn't he try to at least make Charlo and Dervinchenko first? Cause they're both BBC. They keep all the profits and then whoever wins between that, then can fight a Canelo. I mean, I think it's just odd in this, not, not that PBC is fighting PBC cause that's what PBC like to do. But uh, I would have said that just Jerry Vincenco's not, he's a better fighter, but Charlo's probably a bigger star. And yeah, of course. I'd, I'd have thought that they would have tried to have uh, protected him for as long as he can. And I don't know, maybe they're thinking the time's right to cash in on Charlo or something like that because I I stack the chips very, very far towards uh, Derevchenko in that fight. Well, I just think also because Charlo, like, he has a world title at 160. He has a WBC, even though he, he, he got it gifted because Canelo was elevated to franchise. Um, and I, I just think that, like, regardless of the type of promoter you're at, you are, eventually you're going to have to put in, especially if you have a world champion at a certain division, you're going to have to put them in there with somebody who's going to give them a fight. You know, you're going to have to. You're going to have to. Like, like whether it's your, the hype behind you, like a Ryan Garcia or your popularity or the scrutiny you're getting, or you have a world title. Like you can't, like you're gonna have to put them in there against somebody competitive, you know. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I honestly thought a lot more people were gonna take advantage of this whole like world we're living in, and I get it. And it would, it would kind of be justified, like, oh, we need, to, you know, we don't want to do this fight because we need a live gate, you know. I, I, I understand that, but I mean. It, it's, it seemed like they were trying to piece together Charlo, Chris Eubank Jr. I think that would be a pretty decent fight too. I, I, could, I could see that one happening and 
Like who, who do you see? Who do you see winning if they do the Canelo Derivanchenko at one sixty eight? I think Canelo still beats him. You know, do you think it's an easy one though? Because no, I don't. He, think, I don't he's, he's a technician. He's very skillful. No, no, no. I don't think it's easy, but I still, I still think Canelo beats him clearly. But I don't, I don't, I don't think it's going to be a walk in the park. Like, you know, I don't think Canelo is going to have. A tougher time than Triple G did. Mm. He's still he's still going to have a tough time finding the guy. He's still going to hit trouble, but I think he's going to handle him a little bit more easily, using the word "easily" very loosely than Triple G did. If that makes sense. Yeah, because I, I personally thought that Derry Vachenko beat Triple G, and Triple G just got that that victory because they were trying to, you know. Well, I mean, maybe, remember, the, remember, remember the referee in that fight, like kind of jumping behind Triple G when Dervinchenko got him with that body <laughs> shot. I was like, what, what did that? I I watched that. I watched that clip. I rewinded it like ten times, and I was like, why did he jump there? I still can't find. I still can't think of a reason why the referee jumped behind Triple G when he got hit with that body shot, and it obviously hurt him. And he gave them those extra seconds to kind of like recoup. It's like what? Like I don't know. I mean. I get it. It's like it's going back to our original conversation. The shady dealings behind the sport, within the sport. Just whispered to him like in WWE, like, hey, stick to the story. <laughs> Triple G is supposed to win this and then fight Canelo for the third one so everyone gets paid. Yeah, pretty much. But who knows, man? Who knows? But, um, you know, uh, obviously, like we mentioned at the beginning of the show, Mike conducted his interview with uh, Tommy Ward uh, earlier today, just before we recorded this session of the last round podcast. And, you know, before we throw it into that interview, Mike, you want to, you want to tell the listeners what it, what are some highlights of, of the interview? I spoke to Tommy Ward, who's a 29 and 0 British fighter. It's supposed to be uh, hopefully fighting for the WBA, WBO title, which has been vacated by Navarrete. It's supposed to be fighting Stephen Fulton, it's not been confirmed yet, but those I think they're the number one and the number two or three in the division. We kind of briefly spoke about his amateur career, uh, spoke about him, you know, knowing Tyson Fury and Billy Joe Saunders, you know, from the traveling community at a young age, went into his pro career, went into the, his struggles trying to get on with a big promoter. And obviously he turned pro at 18. He's now 26 and having to wait, you know, 29 fights and eight years to... Uh, you know, essentially get those big fights because he's not signed to someone like a Frank Warren or Matt Troom. He talk, spoke about how he actually wants to fight the monster Inoue. Um, talk, spoke about the the upcoming Stephen Fulton fight, what he knows about Stephen, traveling all over the world in the amateurs, traveling over here to fight last year, fighting also in Dubai. And then we kind of spoke about the upcoming Tyson Fury fight, the Billy Joe Saunders Canelo fight and some of the things, but like I kind of said earlier, we got, uh, we got cut off around the 25 minutes mark. So apart from that, the sound isn't too bad in and out a little bit. Cause he was using his cell phone, but I think 95% of it, you can hear. Okay. Cool. Cool. sounds like you guys touched on quite a bit of stuff in the sport and its dealings and all that stuff. So it should be interesting. And then as again, you know, we apologize for some of the audio quality. Um, but Seems like from what you said, Mike, uh, a good 90, 95% of it is pretty decent and it should work out. So, um, but once again, guys, here is our interview, actually Mike's interview with Tommy Ward. And now, now it's time for the last round interview of the week. Twenty nine and zero, Thomas Patrick Ward, another UK guest. How's things back in the UK, Tommy? Everything's okay. It's still bright and sunny. You know, it's nine o'clock at night, so you know things. Uh, family's all fit, well, and healthy. So you know, can't uh, can't really complain. How's training been during uh, the quarantine? Um, it's been different. <laughs> you know, obviously not usually doing your normal routine and such, but. Um, you know, we still be getting the work in, still be keeping fit, and obviously the gyms is hopefully open back up now. So, you know, been back in doing what we uh, what I do best. I saw you managed to do uh, a charity walk for the uh, National Health Service. A big, I think it was a, was it a ten hour walk? 
Yeah, it's an half hour walk. We walked 30 miles uh, the NHS and the local um, community, so we raised some funds and stuff for them. And I um, also done a... No. I also went, I done a... Um, a 20 mile run as well for uh, the RVI in Newcastle, another hospital. Um, for Layla, a little girl who's uh, had was born with a brain tumor, she's eight now or nine, and she's had like 10 operations, something like that. There, so um, and obviously the ward, she's all clear now, thankfully. But uh, the um, the raised money for the ward where she lived there, uh, she like lived most of the time really in there. So you know, just trying to do my little bit for the um. For the community, while obviously there's no boxing on and trying to raise funds and stuff like that, they're just for everyone, just like yourself. If there's a little bit, if it helps somebody just a little bit, you know, you've done your part. So, you know, I'm happy just to, just to help and get involved. That's good to see. That's good to see. Uh, so, Tommy, you started uh, you started boxing pretty young. You followed your brother Martin into uh, the Berkeley Boxing Club at like five years old. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. We um, obviously me me man put put Martin into boxing. Um, he started off in uh, Sherburn and then that gym ended up getting closed down so this community centre really got closed down and went to uh, Burtley where we met uh, Graham Rutherford and um, started training with him and I, like I said I was about five at the time you know didn't really know much but you know I loved, loved fighting so uh, you know I got involved in that and um, I was with Graham till I turned pro at like 17 and a half so you know uh, now I'm under, I'm under Neil Fannin now so yeah I enjoyed it it was uh, it was brilliant, you know. Boxing was so like since the age of five, I've just I fell in love with it and still am. So, you know, I'm um, I'm blessed to be doing a doing a job that um, I get paid and I love to do. So, you know, so win win. You had a pretty uh, a pretty successful amateur career, winning uh, was it two ABA titles, European Championships over in the Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I won um, one. Well, I don't know exactly how many, but I won plenty of. Um, Amateur titles. Um, I had 64 amateur fights, won 60. Uh, the last time I got beat, I think I was about 14 or something like that. So, um, quite a bit of time ago. Um, yeah, so I had a really good amateur career, but I come to the point in my career where it was stay amateur, do the senior ABAs, or turn pro and give go in the pro ranks and get paid. And um, you know, at the time, I just I wanted I wanted to be pro. I wanted to go pro and. Uh, Obviously, my dream has always been winning world titles and fighting for world titles and stuff like that. So, you know, I made the decision to turn pro. Um, at the same point, uh, my brother Martin, who I followed to Burtley, he was with Neil Fannin over in Hartlepool. And I went over, started training with Neil, enjoyed it. You know, me and him got on very well together. Um, he's a very, very good friend of mine now, really, and he's taught me a lot of life lessons along with boxing lessons. And he's, you know, he's fantastic. So, me and him just clicked straight away. And uh, I said, yeah, I'm just going to go pro, you know. And, and, you know, at the time, Neil didn't want me to go pro. Neil was like, I think you should stay amateur another couple of years, you know, um, mature a little bit and get a little bit. Because, I mean, if you see a picture of me when I was 18, I looked at about 12. So, <laughs> you know, um, he wanted me to hold back a little bit. But, you know, I was just, I was keen. I was ready. I wanted to go. I just wanted to move through the pro ranks and start fighting for world titles. Do you kind of miss the pro ranks a little bit? Because obviously, when you turn pro, it kind of turns more of a business. Where when, you, when you're amateur, you don't have to worry about the pay, you don't have to worry about anything. It's just the enjoyment of the sport. Yeah, you do. Yeah, um, when when it's like that, yeah. Because when you're amateur, it's just strictly boxing. There's no, there's no like who am I fighting when I'm in a match. It's just you're training. You, you go, you're fighting Saturday night. And you're like, okay, and whatever weight you had to be, you were there Saturday night. You got weighed in, and then. You know, you just boxed. So, on that behalf of it, yeah, you do miss it. But on the pro side of things, um, obviously everything's a bit more complicated. It's all about money and opponents and where you're fighting at. So I don't want to fight there. I want to fight here. And it's just a lot. Of, but to be honest, I'm, I'm thankful. I got a really good team around me. And um, I've always had with, with Neil. I told Neil from the start. You tell me when to fight, who I fight. I don't care. I said I'm willing to fight any. <laughs> from my pro debut, you know, I was willing to fight anybody. But um, Neil was like, no, I know the road you have to go. This is what we've got to do. Like, like steps up the ladders. And, you know, just follow them. And that, to be honest, Neil, will tell you yourself, everything's been pretty much smooth sailing with us. You know, I've just, I've listened to him. I've never, never questioned his judgment. And, um, you know, I believe in him. And, uh, and I believe I've got the ability to be a world champion and, and fight the best. And, you know, just as long as I just listen to him and, you know, he'll, you know, and I'll get there. So, you know, things have been going really, really well with us. And now we've got MTK, Back in us, 
fantastic team, unbelievable to be honest. I, you know, kind of wish they were they were there a little bit earlier. Um, but you know, we're here now. Like I said, we've got the we've got all the teams all together. Everyone's happy. So you know, all them big fights are going to come. I always knew they would, but you know, on the horizon now. You turned pro, obviously, fairly young at 18, and you had you had a successful amateur career. Did you have many of the big promoters sniffing around you, you know, Frank Warren and Eddie Hearn at, at that time? You know, when I first turned pro, um, you know, no, not really, but I, I didn't really know for myself, like, how to approach them or anything like that, so I just never. And obviously, when I turned pro with Neil, um, the, my manager, Dave Garside, who's still with me now as well, um, who helps like with MTK and that, and um, he's still involved. He, um, you know, he just, he said, like, don't worry about going to talk. And I said, like, I'm, I didn't really know nobody I'm turning pro, so I can't really sell tickets. But, like, I believe in myself. I'm a good fighter. And he believed in me. He come watch me a couple of times, spar and train. And, you know, he just, he started putting the money in. And, um, you know, he all paid out in the end. And he just, just he does that. Probably maybe would have to get a job and, you know, do different bits of bobs and not concentrate fully on the career. And then, um, so he allowed me to do that. So, you know, I was um, very, very good of him, very grateful for it. Did you ever reach out to uh, Tyson Fury and Billy Joe? Because I know that you're kind of friends with them, doing the research. You grew up with them in the traveling community. Yeah, we know each other well. Obviously, Billy Joe was out doing me fighting there, out in Dubai. And, you know, I've met Tyson a good few times, like at shows and obviously at home and stuff like that there. So, you know, we got along all really well. I know them, uh, I know them a long time. So, you know, they're, they're good lads. But yeah, we all got along really well with each other anyway. So we all, all kind of knew each other anyway. So it was all right. Do you think that you, your title, your world title shot would have come around earlier if you'd have been with a bigger promoter? Yeah, yeah I believe so. I believe um, if I had a, like a big promoter on from the early stages, um, probably would have got a world title sooner. But on the other hand, it might have worked out for the better because, you know, I've had 29 fights now. I've had a lot of experience. I've been fought all over the place. So, you know, a couple of different things like that, you know. I believe everything happens for a reason. And I think, um, you know, when my time does come for the world title shot, I believe I'll win it. And I believe then it'll all fall into place the way it should. So, you know, I think, um, like I said, I think everything happens for a reason. So it probably all worked out for the best. You had a big breakout performance last year uh, fighting in the Kansas Star Arena in Kansas. How was that, travelling over here to the US? Obviously, you know, it's kind of every boxer's dream to come out to the US to fight. Yeah, um, <clears throat> fantastic. I mean, uh, you know, I got a phone call off Facebook of um, Hernandez's manager. Obviously, uh, Dimitri uh, Salitas promoted the show, but off his manager, I forget the nice guy's name, but, you know, he just rang me. He's like, yeah, do you fancy a fight with my guy, Jesse Hernandez? And we started talking about the fight. And they said, like, it's going to be in America, you know. And I was just like, is this for real? Uh, anyway, it was like, I said, like, if they want the fight, I said, I'm happy to fight. I, I don't mind. I said, I'll go anywhere and fight anybody. I said, but you need to speak to my team. So I passed them on to my trainer, Neil. And, you know, it was a week later, Neil rang me and went, like, oh, that fight's on. You're fighting in, um, you're fighting in America. It did, did, we didn't even know exactly it was going to be in Kansas because it was supposed to be in New York. And then it got changed. And, Whatever, but we knew it was in America in February, so you know, we just we trained for it, and I like it was fantastic. I mean, we get over to New York, we had 12 days over there, and then we went from there to um, to Kansas, which was an experience on its own. I mean, it's in the middle of nowhere, there's nothing about it. was one hotel, and it was just you know, there's nothing around it, but you know, the full experience, the training in, in the American gyms, and you know, just out there, I loved everything about it. I loved it all. It was, um, it was all a fantastic experience, it was great with the team. and you know, obviously we had a uh, we fought, we put on a really good performance, which I knew we had to. We had to go over there and like really, really show who we was. And I believe that well, the performance it did actually caught everybody's eye, really. So, mm. and that was what I was kind of hoping on, and, and it did. So, you know, but I knew I was well capable of that. I mean, I don't know how some people thought he was going to be the favourite. He had 30 fights or so. You know, I think at the time I had about 25, and like I knew I had a good amateur career. I had I fought some, some good pros. So, like, I, I knew if I turned up right in my game, I would, um, I'd give him the lesson, and I did. But hopefully we can get back over there soon again and we'll um, do some more. I bet they regret reaching out to you now. <laughs> I bet so, yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, you also went over to uh, MTK show in Dubai. How was how was fighting in Dubai? No, fantastic experience went to Dubai. Heard many different stories, but Dubai some was good, some was bad. But I mean, I I thought it was beautiful. It was a beautiful place. The people was unbelievable, friendly. The gyms was fantastic. The city was brilliant. And then again, just the experience of having my whole team out there and then bringing the family across and fighting. It was just amazing, you know. Like I said, I'm so grateful. Like um, I'm doing a job I love, and I'm traveling the world, and you know, fighting, which I love to do. So it's, it's all been a fantastic experience. And like I said, hopefully I'll get a few more of them. Like I do, I do like fighting at home. Newcastle's my home, um, but you know, I don't mind the travel. The travel there is all good experience, you know. And uh, I don't mind going to to, uh, to the back gardens and, and giving a few people a lesson. So. You know, wherever the call comes, I'm happy to go wherever, anywhere. Is that just due to your amateur experience? Obviously, fighting all over the world, are you just used to travelling? Yeah, well, I mean, to me, a ring is a ring. You know, you've, you've got a, a referee, you've got three judges who's all there to, like, obviously, judge the fight and referee you. So, you know, it doesn't matter where it's at. It could be, could be anywhere. So, I mean, it's only you and him fighting there at the end of the day. So, and it's, you've got, like I said, you've got a referee and three judges. So, the, the, the fight could be anywhere at all. It would make a difference to me. With it, looks like uh, Navarrete is stepping up in weight and vacating the WBO title. It's looking like it should be you against Stephen Fulton for the WBO. What do you uh, What mm-hmm. do you know about Stephen Fulton? Nothing much, you know. Really, um, I know he's a, like uh, he's a good fighter. He's undefeated, and uh, but I, I haven't really watched him. To be fair, you know, I know that he obviously was there in the rankings, and he um, he, had, he won a good fight out last and that, but. Um, you know, at, at that kind of level, they're all good good fighters. So, you know, it's hard to say, oh, well, he's no good and this and that. It's, it's, you're not going to get nobody like that. So you're always going to be in for a tough night. You're always going to be in for a, a good fight. So, you know, just pray. But I do believe in my ability and I can beat anybody. Um, so, I, you know, I'll be hopefully that fight can happen and we can come to a deal. Like I said, if he wants to come over here, I'll go over there. I don't mind. I'm sure if I go over there, I'll be bringing a big crowd with me anyhow. Um, so it'll be like home. But, uh yeah, so hopefully we can get together and get, get the fight on. And like I said, he's a, he is a good fighter. What I, what I know of him, I don't know much, but what I know of him, he's a good fighter. So I'm sure it'll be an interesting fight. Has anybody from the WBO or anyone reached out yet at, at all about the fight? Um, you know what it is. You know when it comes to fighting and stuff like that there, I obviously with obviously North Fulton, who, I, who will, will be fighting for the title, but on the management side of things, I leave that all to my team. I think it's less stressful. You know, I just concentrate on doing what I got to do. Leave them deal with it all, and then they'll they'll tell me like oh, the fight's nearly made, the fight's made. So you know, I'm I'm just happy with that. I've, I have trust in them, and they 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 do their job, and I do mine. You know, they get me the fights, and I'll win. So we just we got a good um, a good connection there. I read in a previous interview that you said you'd actually like to fight uh, the monster Inoue. Yes, I definitely would. What do you see in that fight? You just see something where you just think you can beat him or you just want to fight because everyone doesn't want to fight him? Well, for one, nobody wants to fight him. Mm. But two, I, like I said, I do believe I'll beat anybody. Um, Nui's a great fighter, fantastic fighter. You know, he can punch, he can box. He's got a, you know, he's, he's, he's very, very good. Anybody who watches him, you say, you know, he's a good fighter. And I, I've watched him and he is a good fighter. But why would you not want to fight somebody like that? You know, I, I don't get it. I'm I'm 29 and all. If that fight come, I take a look now. People say, oh, well, you got a chance of losing your unbeaten record or whatever. I don't believe so. I believe I'll beat Anui. But why wouldn't you want to fight somebody who nobody thinks you can win? So, you know, to me, that's a good challenge. It's a challenge I like to have. If the phone call come, I'd, I'd love that fight. But obviously, I know he'd probably be doing different things with whatever's going on with them, he's you know he's maxed out at the minute. You know he's a big start in the name, but um, why not take on them type of challenges? Them the type of challenges that I'm in boxing for. I'm not in, I'm not in boxing just to beat people who you think you can beat. I'm in challenges to challenge myself. I think I've beaten Nui, but I know that that would be a very good fight and it'd be a very good challenge. And if you wasn't up to your game, you would get beat. So you need to be a hundred percent. And them's the kind of fights that I want to be in. People like that there. You know, why wouldn't you take on the challenges? That's what I've come into boxing for. If you get the WBO shot against Stephen Fulton, I mean, taking them back to the northeast would be a 
would be a dream for you, obviously. You know, you've got, and then obviously the Northeast thriving at the minute. You've got Lewis Ritson, Joseph Laws, Josh Kelly, your brother Martin. It's probably the strongest the Northeast boxing's ever been. Definitely, bar none. I mean, um, Northeast boxing at the minute is absolutely booming. Like you said, all them names there. You know, we're selling out the Newcastle Arena at the minute. You know, with uh, with Lewis, myself, and the other other boys on. You know, so anybody who comes there, it's going to be a sellout arena. The atmosphere is absolutely unbelievable in there. It's one of the. It probably is the best place you'll ever box on for for the atmosphere. Um. So yeah, if you could, if you know, if we go and win the world title off Fulton. You know, maybe we bring a new over here if he if he fancies it. You know, who knows? That would be that would be brilliant. I read in an interview you were also talking about eventually stepping up to uh, featherweight. Mm-hmm. Is that something? Yeah, after- definitely. I mean, that would be something after you know, hopefully winning the world title and, and you know competing there. So. But yeah, definitely. I mean, like again, there's new challenges. There's new fighters there. There's different fighters there. So definitely, the featherweight division is somewhere that I would like to go, and hopefully even further, even the super featherweight division. You know, I've got big, big ambitions, and obviously you can only take one at a time. But you know, why shoot for the moon? You need to shoot for the stars. You know what I mean? If you miss, you end up in space. So you know, be happy. With um the lockdown period and you know the WBC and you know, quite a few of the other sanctioning bodies have said that you know they're not doing much testing if if any testing at all and with Jamel Jarrell Miller testing positive as a boxer how does that make you feel you know with them um, obviously like you said people testing positive and I just I don't get it I don't get why I mean you're fighting you've got a chance to take somebody's sorry one second You got a chance to take somebody's life, you know. It's um, it's not, it's not, it's, you know, it's not a game. You're serious. You, you're in there. You're fighting, you know. And um, anybody who's on a legal such a substance, and you know, they do damage to somebody. They can put them in a coma. They could give them bleeding on the brain. You know, they can they can take a life. It's murder, you know. So if you go shoot somebody, you, you you're murdering somebody. So anybody who does it, gets caught with doing doing stuff like that, there. If it, you listen, there's a lot of politics in it, so like stuff can happen and. You know, you say, oh, well, I took the wrong thing, I didn't know, and whatever. But if you take on a legal substance and you know that you shouldn't be taking it, you're thinking that, oh, I'll be out of my system time I fight. And you fight and you, you injure somebody, you, you could disable them, like I said, bleeding on the brains, you could even kill them. You know, it, 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 how, how would that make you feel for the fight? You know, this, that's, that's your dungeon. You should be, you should be um, consequences for your actions of doing stuff like that there. I think it's absolutely terrible. I think... You know, you're a fighter, you, you, you eat right, you train right. You know, you do need supplements to, you know, recover your body and, and kind of stuff like that there. But any, like, enhanced stuff that you be taking, stuff like that, I just, I just don't think you should, you know. I just, you know, I think you need you just stop all that there, you know. Just play the game fair, you know, and give it the proper roll of the dice. Can you remember how many times out of your 29 professional fights you've been tested? Oh... I can't remember exactly how many, but I've been tested there. Yeah, I've been tested quite a lot, and um, obviously I've, I've always come up clean. Um, like I said, I just I live a good life, uh, diet right, and you know I don't take now I shouldn't take. And anybody who's offering me stuff, I always say like, is a sport approved? Can I have a look at it? And you know you got to read through what's in wh- whatever you're going to be taking, so you know. And if something comes up that you're not supposed to take, and they say, oh no, it's okay to take. They say, well, I can't because there's, there's you get a list of stuff you can take. Hey, you know all the supplements that's in so you know you score off that it won't show just don't take it you know just take the stuff that you should take and it's, you know you keep yourself right so you know I think it's um, like I said listen you're playing with people's lives so you know just do, do, do it properly you know I wouldn't I wouldn't like that on my mind if I took something that I shouldn't have took and then I've injured somebody permanently for life you know that would be be terrible you know something on your mind like that that would be and knowing you've done it, it's just wrong, very wrong. If the WBO title shot comes around during lockdown, you don't mind fighting behind closed doors? No, uh, obviously, you've got to fight. Uh, if the fight comes up, you've got to fight. Um, but obviously, it is better with the crowd there. You know, the crowd gets behind it. They do They do make the night. You need, you need crowd with boxing. But obviously, if the show can go ahead without the crowd, 
and everything's running smoothly, yes, I'd still fight, yeah. But it, it would be better with the crowd, obviously. A friend of yours, Billy Joe Saunders, do you think uh, he'll eventually get the Canelo fight? I think so. I mean, Billy Joe Saunders... Two world champion level, obviously. So does Canelo. Canelo's. Mm. Are we there? Yeah. Are we there? Yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, Canelo obviously is, is a star at the minute. He's he's the number one at the minute. But Billy Joe brings lots to the table. But you know, even speaking to Billy Joe, it's a fantastic fight. It's fantastic money. It's a mega fight. But Billy Joe's there for one reason. One reason only, and it's a win. It's not about money. It's not about where it's going to be at. Nothing. It's just about winning and beating Canelo. And you know. He has the ability to beat Canelo. You know, Billy Joe's very tricky. Slick self for fast, good movement, hard to hit. You know, he struggled a lot with Lara, Canelo did. You know, he was, when he was on his feet moving, he, he did. He struggled a lot. Yes, he got inside and done work to the body, but he maybe nicked the fight. But, I mean, um, I think Billy Joe can give him all the problems in the world. But, again, the one thing on his mind, it's not the money, it's not the fight. It's just beating Canelo. And um, I've... So he needs to be right for the fight. And I believe if he does, he's got a good chance of winning the fight. Another friend of yours, Tyson Fury, eventually should hopefully be fighting Anthony Joshua. How do you see that one going? You know, um, obviously, he's fighting Wilder next. Obviously, mm. the last time out, he, well, he bashed Wilder up. Um, but, you know, not two, two fights is never the same, I don't think. So, you know, you've got to be expecting something different there. But, you know, Tyson... Tyson's the best heavyweight, mm. I think, bar none. Um, I think he'll come through the Wilder fight, and I think he'll, I think he'll outbox Joshua for twelve rounds. He might even get more let on because Joshua's good for the first six, then he dips. He dips. I don't know. I think he might be too muscle bound or whatever. He seems to dip for a couple of rounds, and then he comes on strong again. But I think with Tyson, he's a good, great, and another good mover for a heavyweight. Slick, hard to hit. You know, he's, got, he's so big. He's so got he's big, big and tall, got the long reach. You know, I think they'll just catch AJ, keep catching him, tagging him, dancing about and that and um, frustrating him and maybe even get him later on. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Um, another fighter from the travelling community, Dennis McCann. Do you know Dennis? Yeah, I met Dennis when I boxed in uh, Brentwood after, after me fighting um, America, Kansas. Yeah, lovely lad. Um, obviously, coming through the pro ranks, looking really good. Mm. What What do you think of him for the future? He seems like a huge prospect. He seems to have, you know, every, everybody's comparing him to Prince Nazim because of his style. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you can see the Nazim sort of kind of style in, in him. You know, that with his his wide wide stance and his footwork, and obviously the certain shots he throws and that there. But again, a promising pr- prospect, looking really well at the minute, training hard. Um, I think he'll do really well. Yeah, I think he'll do really well as long as he uh, like keeps doing what he's doing, training hard, keep the fights coming. Obviously, you know, as he steps up, he won't be blasting out people as easy. Um, but I think, yeah, I think he's got, I think he's got good potential there, definitely. Going back to your division, you've got uh, Ray Vargas is obviously the WBC champion. You've got Ronnie Rios and also uh, Brandon Figueroa is the WBA. Are they yeah, yeah. match matchups? Obviously, you'd like to take in the future. Definitely. Um, obviously, like I said, like the world title uh, WBO is vacant now. You know, closer being hopefully getting mad between me and Fulton, so that can happen. If um, if that happens, win that. I would love to fight any of them champions for unification, without doubt. Uh, like I said, this is, me and my team's easy to work with. You know. Um, so any any one of them fights would be brilliant. If the WBO doesn't happen, if one of them fighters want to fight, you know, I'm always available. Pick up the phone, give us a call. We'll work something out. You know, it wouldn't be an issue. Again, all great champions, all good fighters, but all fights I want to have, you know, them's the kind of fights you want to be involved in, them's the kind of fight you want to have. So, you know, them's the ones I'll be looking at. I won't be uh, looking at nobody else. I'm, I'm, my main focus is on all, all them guys at the minute. Tommy, where do you see yourself hopefully in the next five years? Oh, a good question there. You know, I, I, well, I do believe I'll be a world champion at super bantamweight, featherweight, and then possibly even super featherweight in the next five years. I definitely think I'll be um, 
Superman went and featherweight. You know, like I said, I'd be going out super featherweight. I just want to keep on fighting the best fights out there, the best fighters out there, and keep testing yourself, keep moving up. You know what I mean? You know, I'm unbeaten at the minute, and uh, you know, I want I want the best, biggest fights out there. Um, you know, pro- so them them's the kinds of like I said, them's the kinds of guys I'm looking at. I'm not looking past nobody at the minute. Obviously, we'll hopefully get Fulton, and then we've got the we lot got a lot of good guys at super featherweight division. There's a lot of good guys at super featherweight division. So you know, I've um, I've got a lot in my hands, really. <laughs> uh, but you know, we'll uh, we'll take each challenge as it comes. You know, like I said, even even the monster, you know, depending on what he's doing at the bantamweight, if he's moving up the, you know, if we win a world title, at, if I win a world title at super bantamweight, and he's moving up, you know, if the fights there can be made, he's a great fighter. I'd love to fight him, you know. So we will just see how it goes. You know, just keep 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 on going and just take one step at a time. I saw on your social media you'd been sparring with uh, Jordan Gill. Yeah. What did you What did you think of him? He seems like a rising prospect. Yeah, and um, trained under Dave Caldwell. Um, you know, nice fella. Um, good fighter as well. Like you said, a rising prospect. You know, I think um, I think he'll do. I think he'll do well as well. Obviously, he had a bit of a bump in the road. Um, his last time out, he might have had a win since then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, had a bit of a bump in the road there. But I think um, you know that happens in boxing. I mean, stuff like that can happen. You have a bad night or. Something might have went wrong, I don't know, but you know, um, he's better than that, so I know that he'll come back and he'll, he'll, he'll do, do really well. He's fighting Bellotti, I think, next, you know, big, big fight, think, um, big fight. I think I favor Gil for us, um, but again, it'll be a good fight, so um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think he'll do really well. So at this point is where we lost uh, Mr. Tommy Ward. But, um, you know, we'd like to thank Tommy for jumping on this week on the last round, episode 87. Uh, Thanks to Mike for uh, conducting that without me. Um, But as we said, we did have some audio difficulties uh, with with this interview. And, and, you know, it looks like his, his... his connection might have got cut off right here towards the end. Um, but once again, you know, we appreciate you guys listening, especially if you listen to the whole show. We appreciate it. Um, you know, well, we hope you enjoyed the topics we discussed today. And then obviously the topics that Mike discussed with Tommy Ward. Um, you know, obviously you can follow the show on Twitter, on Instagram at the last round 12 T H E. Uh, last round 12 I should have spelled it all out but I didn't I just got lazy right in the middle of spelling Um, but once again thank you very much for listening Uh, whether you've been listening since the beginning when we started about coming up on two years ago or you're a brand new listener we appreciate it Um, and then if you want to know how we've been recording these these podcasts uh, in this quarantine time we've been using a platform uh, called StreamYard StreamYard StreamYard.com they have a free version and they also have a paid version. Uh, it's it's very cool. You can just send your 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 guests a link. They don't have to download any any type of software like Skype or anything like that. They just click the link and it takes them to to the um, to the actual interview and you can see them on 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 each screen. It's very convenient. Um, and then you can um, depending on if you have a paid version or not, you can download the audio for your podcast, download the video for your YouTube channel. It's a very convenient uh, software program to have. So that's what we've been using. Um, If you do want to check it out, um, we do have an affiliate link that's listed below in the description of of our podcast here, um, whether it's on YouTube or um, on Audio Boom, Spotify, Stitcher, all these different spots. Um, And it does kick us back um, some type of credit for our account as well. As you guys know, Mike and I, we don't you know nobody we're not sponsored by anybody we don't get paid for this um so if you want to support um that'd be that'd be great if you can uh check that out but once again thank you to tommy ward for jumping on this week with mike on the last round episode 87 and once again i'm danny z for my co-host michael shepherd who's not here at the moment this is the last round Thanks for supporting and listening to the show. Follow us at The Last Round 12 on social media. Rate, review, and subscribe. This is The Last Round Podcast.